Hi, so uh, I'm Yannick. Um, I'm going to be going over a bit of uh, solar um, history and then a little bit about some of the new features. Um, so I get asked enough about the origins of solar that I finally thought I'd, I'd just go ahead and put it in a presentation. Um, and so what happened is that early in 2004, maybe even a little earlier, CNET Networks, um, there was, they had to find a replacement for the enterprise search technology they were using. It was commercial, um, and it was embedded in a server that they used across many web properties. Um, and the uh, vendor was end of lifing it, so uh, they, they went through the whole song and dance of uh, putting out RFPs to all the usual suspects at the time, all the commercial enterprise search vendors. And everything always just came back as too expensive because they just had a ton of small web properties. So you just add up all those server licenses and it's just, it was uh, not going anywhere. And so they decided to um, build their own out of open source software. And so they came up with Atomics, um, which is a, a clever uh, acronym, Apache to MySQL in CNET search. Um, and it was basically a marriage of uh, Apache HTTPD and MySQL into sort of like a server that spoke HTTPD and you know they could stick with, um, behind load balancers and scale out a separate search tier. They selected MySQL because a lot of um, their collections, the majority of their collections in fact, were simple things like ID lookups, group lookups, uh, Boolean logic, sorting, uh, all things that MySQL can you know, handle fine. And so that, you know, it, it worked for most things. However, they knew that um, they needed a backup plan for you know, things that it wasn't going to work as well on, like full text search relevance. Um, it wasn't the greatest in MySQL. They knew it, but they didn't really need it immediately, it seems. So, so what they did is actually, um, they built Atomics first, and then entered me around the summer of 2004. And I joined CNET Networks, and I was quickly given uh, the task of building this Plan B, just something based on Lucene, because Lucene was getting popular at the time. It was really a, a developer's dream job. I got lucky, um, because there were no requirements, no users. I was, I was, <laughs> I was literally told, go build what makes sense. And that was it, so it was like, awesome. And I had no other responsibilities, because I was a, a new hire, so. Um, <laughs> so I, I quickly threw together a prototype called Fusion. Um, I, was, I was trying to keep with the Atomics theme. Um, and uh, luckily my boss is better at coming up with like acronyms and stuff, he's much more clever. And, and uh, he was uh, Clay Webster at the time, and uh, he renamed it Solar for Search on Lucene and Resin. Uh, Resin's an uh, application server that CNET uh, used at the time. So uh, I quickly threw together this prototype, and then I uh, threw some data in it. Um, I think it might have been from like the music database or something like that, and I tested it against Atomics, and it was a lot slower. And I was like, oh no, this is no good. <laughs> um, so I went to uh, the Lucene mailing list. If you go and look at the archives, this is my first email to the Lucene mailing list. And it's, uh, it, the, the title is something to the effect of, Lucene's slower than MySQL. Um, <laughs> I, I probably could have found a better way to put that, but uh, luckily, Doug Cutting responds, um, and he looks at some of the info I've provided, and he says, well, you know, th these terms that match a lot of documents, um, if you pull those out, and cache those as a filter, um, you know, you should see some speed ups. And so I went and quickly implemented this optimization. Sure enough, all of a sudden we were a lot faster than MySQL. I was a big hero, and you know, thanks to Doug Cutting, of course, and, um, and we were off to the races. So um, I also wanted to give you a little uh, insight into, for anybody who's used um, Lucene 3 and below, why the admin interface looked like it did. You might think at a glance that this is the admin interface, but if you look, it's actually from Atomics. Um, and it's got like, you know, a, a SQL statement in there and stuff. So yeah, I'm not a GUI guy. I just ripped off the CSS. That's why the way, it looked the way it did. 
That's also why, um, interestingly enough, like some of the parameters look a little bit the way they do. It's kind of historical, like for the number of documents you want back in Solar, right? What's the parameter? Rows. This is why I was sort of like copying some of the um, Atomics interface, you know, where it made sense to make some of the URLs look similar. Now, of course, we have the new, uh, nice new uh, Solar 4 admin interface that everyone loves, thanks to uh, Stefan. It's cut off a little. So I, uh, I took a shot at trying to put together a timeline. Um, it's crooked because like all good graphs, it should go up and to the right, right? Um, so, and I ran out of space around 1.4 also. Um, but anyway, the initial prototype, as I said, is like in the summer of uh, 2004. We quickly needed replication because um, if this is powering your websites, you need at least search side fault tolerance. So if one box goes down, your website doesn't go down. That's no good. And so we were throwing around a lot of ideas about how to do this. Um, um, I finally went to the Lucene uh, mailing list again, you know, just brainstorming ideas, and along comes Doug Cutting again, saving the day. Um, and, and, you know, it's like just hands the design to us. He's like, well, here's what we did at Technorati. And that became literally Solar's first replication strategy. Um, yeah, so uh, around the end of 2004, Solar finally got its first user. Um, there was a guy that some of you might know named Chris Hostetter, Hossman. Uh, he was on the other coast, and he was trying to implement CNET's first faceted search, and it's playing around with Lucene. And the CTO at the time, Ted Cahal, uh, you know, he pointed Chris at uh, Solar and said, hey, we've already got something going on here. And so, you know, we figured out how to implement faceted search in Solar. It was initially through a plug-in. Um, the simple faceting didn't come along until later. And then, um, you know, we actually went live um, in the middle of 2005, uh, CNET reviews, faceted search on Solar. Um, and then 2006, January 2006, uh, you know, Solar was contributed to the um, Apache Software Foundation, and then a year later, it graduated. And as um, the funny, like, jump from 1.3, no, I'm sorry, from 1.4 to 3.1, uh, that's where uh, the Lucene Solar merge happened, and Solar's version number jumped up to match Lucene's. So then we get to our latest huge release. It was a big, big milestone in uh, Solar's history. Solar 4 happened about the end of last year. Um, and of course, you know, the biggest feature was distributed indexing. Uh, no single points of failure. So like, you know, you don't have to have like a single master that could go down. Um, and we architected to sort of be like real, uh, real near time friendly. And we also architected it so that we could uh, have a sort of move more into the NoSQL space. So for instance, you know, we have update durability thanks to a transaction log, um, a real-time get, so you don't have to do a commit to get the latest version of a document. It makes it much more useful as a data store in general. Atomic updates, optimistic concurrency, um, and then a whole slew of other features too. Uh, so here's the, uh, one of the charts from a recent survey from last, um, I think just last month. And it just sort of shows that, uh, you know, solar seeing um, a pretty good, solar four in particular, is seeing pretty good adoption. It's like over 50% of people, when they're asked, you know, like they're, they're on some version of solar four. And then of course, like all, uh, about a third are still on uh, solar three X, and hopefully a lot of, they plan on updating at some point. So um, I also wanted to get even a little more technical and uh, jump into some recent enhancements since um, Solar 4 is released. This isn't going to be comprehensive or anything. It's just going to be a couple things I just wanted to point out. Um, so the first is document routing. So how we do document routing is that there's a hash ring, 32-bit hash ring. Um, and you basically take the unique ID, um, run it through MemorHash 3, 
you come up with a, a hash value and then it um, goes in the ring somewhere and then you look at what shard is responsible for that hash range. So there's, um, there's a problem though sometimes when you have, when people want a huge collection to support many, many, many um, users or customers. Now if you do this uh, straight ID hashing, what happens is that a single customer's documents will be evenly distributed around the whole hash ring and hence to query that customer's documents, you'll have to query all of um, the whole cluster, all the shards in the cluster, right? And so this is less than ideal. If we had a way to co-locate um, all of a uh, customer's data, then we could just like query, you know, one shard or a smaller set of shards. And so that's the idea around this enhanced document routing. This is actually the default in SolarNow. Um, and the router is composite ID. And so how this works is that um, if, it's optional, if the composite ID router sees a bang in the ID, it will use the first part of that, run it through memory hash three, and generate, just use the top 16 bits um, as, as part of the hash key. And then the, the, the second part will be the lower 16 bits. Um, and so what that essentially does is it divides up our hash ring into slices. And those slices, it's 65536 slices to be precise. Um, and each slice has 65536 um, hash values. So it's 65536 wide. Um, and so now all of our documents from a single user go into this hash slice. Now, at query time, we have a new parameter called shard.keys. And if you provide this to Solar, um, Solar will go and run it through the hash code again and only, use, only generate the top bits, though. And then the bottom bits, it'll let float from its minimum value to its maximum value, generating a range. And from that range, that's the range that we need, that we know that we need to query to satisfy um, you know, the request and search over all the user's documents. And so in this case, you know, we look it up in the, uh, the cluster state and we go, oh, we only have to query shard one and that'll hit all the user's documents that we're interested in. Um, we, we actually have an option to support for hashing on a separate field. Um, you know, some people like sort of requested that, but it's not the default because that makes things more difficult. So if you think about it, um, you know, for, for clients or stuff like that, if, you, if you're hashing on a separate field, say like customer ID and not the actual ID field, then whenever you do something that needs to find a document in the cluster, you also need to know what this extra field is and what its value is. The ID is no longer good enough. And so that's just a pain, um, especially for if you're trying to write any generic clients. It's nice to be able to get a document, oh, here's the ID, delete it. If you're not giving all the information to find it in the cluster, then you have to move to things like um, broadcasting to the entire cluster, and that's not the most scalable uh, way either. And so that's why, that's why we really went with putting all the information in the ID necessary to locate that document efficiently. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is like that, that some people first question, like why are we not just generating a single hash from the prefix? That seems good enough, that's what other systems do. Um, why are we generating like a slice instead of a single value? And the reason is because we had this in mind, shard splitting. So in the release coming up, which should be released any day now, we're on, we're on uh, release candidate four now, I believe. So um, definitely by next week, it should be out. We have uh, seamless online shard splitting. And so how this works is that um, for any given shard, if you can tell it to split, and it'll create two or more um, sub shards in the construction state. And so then what'll happen is that updates to the shard, in addition to going to its normal replicas, they'll also be forwarded to the applicable subshards. Now when these subshards 
get these updates, they don't just like index it, they buffer it into a transaction log. And in the meantime, we've started to split the, uh, the index on the leader in shard two. And once that split is done, we don't re-index the documents or anything, we actually split the index and install those on the subshards. And then those subshards replay the buffered updates um, and that brings them up to date. And so then they go active, the original shard you know, goes inactive, and where we had one shard, now we have two shards. And it's all seamless, you can keep indexing while this is happening, keep searching. So some other cloud enhancements that we've had, um, request forwarding. Previously, uh, if you had a cluster with multiple collections, you'd have to set, you could sort of send requests to uh, uh, query request to any node, but you couldn't send update requests to uh, any node. You basically, you had to hit a node that knew about the collection, the specific collection. Now we have request forwarding, so you can hit any node in the cluster, and if it doesn't have any shards um, for that collection, it'll forward it to one who does. Collection aliases is something that was added, I think, in 4.2. Um, and so, just as an example, you just hit a URL, say create alias, give the name of a collection that's sort of a virtual collection or alias that you wanna create, in this case, Northeast, and then you give the actual collections that that maps to, and in this case, you know, states in the Northeast, assume that we have a collection per state. And we're gonna do this um, also for shards, uh, but we just haven't gotten around to it yet. So uh, thanks to my colleague, Steve Rowe, um, Solar now has a schema REST API. You know, instead of just like grabbing the schema XML and having to parse it yourself, um, Steve integrated RESTlet into Solar. We didn't start off with RESTlet because Solar is actually an older project than RESTlet itself. I went and looked and it's like, oh yeah, RESTlet hadn't even started yet. Um, so now we have APIs, um, REST APIs to go and, you know, get uh, the properties of a field, comes back in nice JSON. You can also request uh, XML. Um, you can do get all fields, field types, pretty much anything in the schema you can get. Um, and of course, you can get the entire schema um, in, in uh, JSON or in like, you know, the original solar XML format for schemas. But the really cool thing that also came with this REST API is the ability to dynamically add fields. So now we just do a put on the URL for a field that doesn't exist yet. We give it the properties and Solar will add it to the schema and then persist it. Um, so this works also in cloud mode. So it will persist the changes to Zookeeper and other nodes will see that, oh, there's been a change and they'll all update their schemas. So one of the things we plan on doing with this is implementing more schema lists. Of course, I always like to point out that there really is no such thing as true schema lists in uh, Lucene um, because, you know, if you need to index a field the same way on all the documents if you're gonna search them all. Um, so this is really more about what I call like type guessing. It's really about fields that you haven't seen yet. Um, then you sort of like look at the value and try to guess, oh, what is this type? I'm gonna start indexing it um, as this type. Of course, that has dangers, right? Because you could guess wrong. And then, you know, what do you do later when you get, uh, you know, another value that just doesn't fit into that what you've picked? Um, but some people like it for prototyping, um, so, you know, that's, that's on our near-term roadmap. So, in general, in the future, um, I think, you know, we're, we're uh, just vague thing, hand wavy, we, you know, we're looking at greater scalability, more solar cloud APIs um, to basically programmatically control the cluster, more NoSQL, features like, you know, just different ways to update um, your documents and manipulate documents. Um, for example, maybe, you know, update by query. That's uh, something I've seen sometimes. Uh, um, analytics, you know, Solar's always had faceting. That's always been one of its most popular features. We're definitely gonna push more on the faceting, functions, statistics. Um, improved relational queries, you know, traditionally, um, 
when people say they want relations between documents, the answer is always don't do that, denormalize. Um, but sometimes it's very hard for people, you know, so it's, Solar does have a basic pseudo join, but it is pretty basic. It's only, you know, useful in certain scenarios, but I think we should really, you know, expand uh, the functionality there. Um, more dynamic, more settings and configurations. You're seeing that in the schema. We should also do some of the same things for the solar config, make more and more things settable and changeable through APIs instead of having to, you know, edit the config file and reload a core. And of course, you know, continued focus on uh, ease of use, um, which we always try to do. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't spend too much time at all on, on future roadmap just because it's, uh, it's so hard in open source and it's you know, all, almost to the point of point, pointless because it's driven by the community. So it's really you know, also what all you guys want to work on and uh, contribute. So I look forward to, uh, to continually improving solar with all your help and, and that's my presentation.